Welcome to church. Let's all stand up. If you're ready to give Him glory, exalt Him. Exalt Him in this place. Amen. So all clap our hands. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands. Yes. There's a light that shines with hope and grace. Fills the sky with your mercy each day. We're alive. Let your glory burn out, Jesus. Yes, there's a joy that overwhelms our souls. Cause we know our God is in control of the flow. Let your favor pour out, Jesus. Jesus. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. This is the day that the Lord has made. Will we rejoice? Will we rejoice and be glad? Will we rejoice, will we rejoice, and be glad in Him? There's a joy that overwhelms our souls, cause we know our God is in control, overflow. Let your favor pour out, Jesus. Come on! Oh, Jesus, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. Will we rejoice? Will we rejoice and be glad in it? Will we rejoice? Will we rejoice and be glad in it? Yeah. Na 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 na. Come on. Na 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 na. Now we say. What happened yesterday? Cause today there's a new thing happening. Be behind what happened yesterday. Cause today there's a new thing happening. All be behind what happened yesterday. Cause today there's a new thing happening. Be behind what happened yesterday. Cause today. Yesterday, cause today there's a new thing happening. Leave behind what happened yesterday, cause today there's a new thing happening. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come on, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Will we rejoice? Will we rejoice and be glad in it? We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Will we rejoice? Will we rejoice and be glad? Come on, get out! Hey, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Will we rejoice? Will we rejoice and be glad in it? Will we rejoice? Will we rejoice and be glad in it? Will we rejoice? Will we rejoice and be glad in it? Glory to Jesus! Shouts of thanks, shouts of joy, now and forever, God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we come to you, God, in the right spirit, and we choose Lord Jesus Christ-like character to bring out the spirit of truth and worship within us, out in this world. Thank you, Jesus, that we understand that one simple mistake of our words can cause somebody sorrow for a lifetime. So we choose Christ-like character, and we come to you in speaking of truth because we have the truth in us. Oh, that's where our foundation lies. Build our life in that, Lord Jesus. 
Oh, we thank you. There's a touch of heaven today as we worship you. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you in this place.
inside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Oh 
now and forever. Amen, Gabriel. Thank you for worshiping with us. Please greet your neighbor. Bless them with your beautiful Sunday worship greeting. Amen. And after that, turn your eyes on the screen for the announcement. God bless you, Gateway. Hey, Gateway. Happy Sunday. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here with us at Gateway today. If you're a guest, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We are honored that you chose to come and spend a Sunday with us here at Gateway. And our prayer is that you feel very welcomed and at home here in our service today. If you are that guest, we'd love if you do us a favor and fill out what we call a Connect card. You'll find one of those cards under the seat in front of you or on the table at the back of the auditorium. Simply fill it out and drop it in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. Also, if you are that guest, we have a special guest gift bag for first-time Gateway guests. At the end of the service, there will be a Gateway volunteer at the table at the back of the auditorium ready to give you your guest bag if you simply tell them, I'm a first-time guest at Gateway. Welcome to Gateway. We pray you enjoy your experience here today. We believe that having a Bible is so important to the Christian walk, a tangible Bible that you can open and read every day. But if you don't have a copy of one, we want to make sure you have one in your hands before you leave church today. At that table at the back of the auditorium, there's a Gateway volunteer stationed with a smile, ready to give you your very own Bible. So at the end of the service, head to the table at the back of the auditorium if you want to pick up your very own copy of God's Word. Make sure you're staying tuned to our online church calendar for everything you need to know that happens here throughout the week. Head to gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening and there you will find all of the scheduled events that happen at the church. Make sure you're staying close to that calendar over the summer month as some of our regular programming changes due to summer scheduling. If you usually attend our Saturday morning book reading, they just started a new book yesterday called The Answer to Anxiety by Joyce Meyer. And maybe you've never attended this book reading, now is your chance to get in on it as they're only one week in. Saturday mornings at 9.30 right here at the church. Our Summer Sunday Barbecue is coming up on Sunday, July 23rd, and we are so excited. We are projecting with faith that it is going to be a beautiful day and we will enjoy each other's company following the service. Speaking of service, on that Sunday, Sunday, July 23rd only, we are having one service at 10.30. We are going to pack out this auditorium and come together as one church body to worship the Lord together. Then following the service, we are going to head outside for a beautiful barbecue. Also, there will be games for the kids and fun for everyone. So make sure you're planning to be here on Sunday, July 23rd for the service at 10.30 and lunch after. Also, this is a great opportunity to invite someone to join you for church. Use this barbecue as an invitation tool to invite a friend or family member to join you on that Sunday. Also, there are still volunteer spots available because it takes many hands to put on an event like this. So if you'd like to volunteer, we would love to hear from you. You can sign up at the info desk today to volunteer. Thank you, Gateway, for your continued giving into God's house. Your giving is obedience to God's word, as God clearly instructs us to bring the first tenth of everything that comes into our house, what we earn, and give it back to the Lord. When we do this act called the tithe, that means that God is ready to pour out his blessing on us and our families. And you know, the Bible even says, test me in this, test me, bring your tithe into the local church and see what I can do for you. It is a blessing that we get to give into God's house. And thank you for partnering with us in our mission of pointing people to Jesus and celebrating changed lives. There are three ways that we can continue to give today. The first is by giving in person. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes. The second is by heading to gatewayonline.ca slash give and following the prompts to give online. And the third way is by text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now. That's all I got for you, Gateway. So thank you for being here in church today. We'll see you again next Sunday right here. Now, Pastor Brian, over to you for the next part in our series, Extraordinary. Good afternoon, Gateway. So good to see you here. And hey, did anybody notice the floor? Now, I know you're a positive bunch. You're always looking up. But today, I invite you to, to look down and check out the floor. It is so beautiful. The floor has received a, a makeover, a facelift. Yeah, thanks to, to Jay and Zoe King and Zoe's dad, Kermit. They came in last week, and they did a strip and rewax job on the auditorium floor. Also, the washrooms. It's a 
big job. They came in first thing in the morning. They worked all day until 2.30 in the morning the following day when they finally got it all done. And wow, it was so worth it. See, this is the business that they are in. And before the Lord, they felt they wanted to do this for the church. God bless them for it. Amen. Yeah, and I tell you what, they did it with a real servant heart. In fact, this floor job as it was unfolding, it kind of reminded me of, of one of the stories that I've had for years in my file, and, and I pulled it out. It's a story about the famous French pianist, Nadia Boulanger, and, and, and she tells about the utmost respect that she had for her cleaning lady, whose name was Madame Duval. And Madame Duval was 80 years old when this took place. One day, the older lady, she timidly knocked on the door of the younger lady who she worked for and and she said mademoiselle i know you don't like to be disturbed but please come and see the floor how it shines amen i love that story that is just so sweet and uh, we just want to say wow thank you again so much zoe and to jay and and Kermit, because this floor is just shining and whoever puts the first scuff mark on it will be forgiven. After all, this is a church, right? <laughs> all right, before we get into our message today, come on, would you stand to your feet on this shiny floor, and would you passionately repeat after me, I love God, therefore I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest example. I want to follow with passion the leading of Christ. Say, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. You say amen? amen. Come on, somebody give the Lord some praise. Yeah, the Bible says that the entrance of his word gives light, which really means that you're going to be smarter when you leave today than you were when you came in. Amen. You may be seated. And just a quick word to those who are watching online, welcome. We are so glad to have you with us. And hey, as I mentioned to the folks in the earlier service today... Uh, Gateway people, you just got to know if there's somebody that you're reaching out to and you've been wanting to invite them to, to come with you to church one of these Sunday mornings, but so far, for whatever reason, they just haven't made it with you to church, you have this tool available that you could always say to them, hey, why don't you watch our church online first? Yeah, just tell them how to, to go online, you know, Gateway, Church, Regina, YouTube, and it'll come up, all the services going back for four years, and, uh, and so that's just available to you. You could invite somebody to watch online, and, and who knows, it could spark an interest, and somebody could find themselves happily in the kingdom of God as a result of your influence and the church's influence, and most especially, the Holy Spirit's influence. Can you say amen? amen? All right, our teaching series, as you know by now, is called Extraordinary. Where did we get that title from? Well, in a roundabout way, we got it from Leviticus chapter 22. That's where the Lord is emphasizing to Moses and company. He says, I am Jehovah, the Lord, your miraculous God. And then in verse 32 from the Living Bible, the Lord said, you must not treat me as common and ordinary. Folks, the whole point of this uh, sermon series is that, that we, we don't get so used to the Lord that we kind of take him for granted and lose sight of, the, of his greatness, his, his awesomeness. He is the extraordinary God who is so worthy of praise and respect. So don't let a day go by without acknowledging the wow factor that is so much a part of, of knowing the living God on a personal level basis. We, we ought to be like, Lord, I never cease to be amazed by your goodness, by your power, by, by your wisdom from above. Come on, somebody say amen. The past several weeks, we've been talking about how extraordinary he is by virtue of his divine attributes, as we call it in theology. And we've covered 13 of them. And so if you missed any of those sessions, again, you can go online, get yourself caught up, do some binge watching of sermons, right? So today, let's move on. Today, let's talk about God is extraordinary as the creator. 
So just turn to somebody next to you and say, wow, he did a great job creating you. Yeah. Folks, he's the master architect. He's the divine engineer. God is the ingenious creator of everything. All right, the first verse in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And somebody said this is the first mention of sports in the Bible. Yeah, the game of baseball is referenced in the first verse of God's Word. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? He's the intelligent designer. Here's what it says. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. In other words, the visible creation is proof positive of the invisible God. So no one is without excuse. I mean, just look around. The evidence is everywhere, obviously. Of course, there is a God. You know, in Psalm 104, that's, that's a beautiful song about God's creative ingenuity. And I, I can't read the whole chapter, so that can be your homework assignment, right? Read Psalm 104. But in verse 10, it talks about how the Lord causes springs of water to flow down from between the mountains. What a novel idea. Like, how many of you have ever driven through British Columbia in the summertime? And, and you know what it is. You, you, you see that, that little trickle of, of water coming down on the rocks on the side of the road. And what do you do? You pull over and you dig out a cup and you go and you get, get some of that water. You catch it in your cup. I mean, it is cold and it is clear. It's some of the best water you've ever drank. Come on, how many of you have done that on the side of the road in beautiful British Columbia? Let me see your hands nice and high. Wow, I was thinking there'd be lots of you, but only a few. But you, you get the message. You understand what I'm talking about. This is, this is the creative handiwork of the Lord. He goes on in verse 14. He says, God makes the grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth fruit, food from the earth. And then he goes on and he talks about how, you know, there are some of the animals in the animal kingdom that are nocturnal. They come out at nighttime. And, and then in verse 22, he says, and then the sun rises and those, those, those creatures of the night, then they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. And then people, humans, go out to their work and their labor until evening. And so it's kind of like shift work, right? You got the, the, uh, the animals that are doing the midnight shift and then the, the humans that are doing the day shift and getting the job done, right? But then in verse 24, it's kind of a summation of all the, the, the amazing things that he makes mention of in this chapter. Verse 24, he says, how many are your works, Lord? In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. You see, creation should be to us such a marvel. You know, you see a bird flying through the air. And have you ever stood back and watched the birds and commented to, to someone and said, wow, they're so graceful the way they, they can float like that. And sometimes you, you even might catch yourself saying, I'd like to fly like that. And I'm telling you what, there's coming a day when I'm going to fly. I'm going to get raptured out of here. No airplane, no jet pack, no pogo stick. Honey, I'm going to fly like a bird. Somebody say amen. amen. It's very cool the way God has created those, those birds to have flight. There's so many things in the created realm that should impress us and inspire us. But, but the problem is we just kind of get used to it. See, all this stuff around us, and we, we get used to it. They, you know, they have what they call the seven natural wonders of the world. I don't think Niagara Falls made the, the list, but there was one young man who was a recent graduate of plumbing school, and he and some of his buddies, they went down to Niagara Falls. It was his first time there. And man, you know, first time you visit Niagara Falls, wow, it is spectacular. It was just incredible. And here's this young man. He's studying this rock formation, you know. It's like a horseshoe and, and just the volume of water that's pouring over those rocks at nighttime for, for a real cool effect. They shine these big colored spotlights on the falls. And so here's this young guy. He's, he's looking at Niagara Falls. And then after a few minutes, he turns to his buddies and he says, I think I can fix this. 
Right? He, just, he just got out of plumbing school. I think I can fix this. Just turn to somebody right now and say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Man, you could ruin the honeymoon of a lot of couples if you stop the flow of water going over the Niagara Falls. But listen, if you've been there, you know what it is to stand amazed. Somebody made this observation. They said, for us as adults, there are seven wonders in the world. But for a child, a little impressionable child. There are seven million wonders in the world, right? It's the age of discovery. Daddy, daddy, come quickly. There's an ant that is carrying a grain of rice across the sidewalk here in the backyard. Listen, dad, do not say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that lots of times. No big deal. Don't say that. Go over and enjoy the moment. It could be a teachable moment. Son, isn't that cool? God has created the ant that it's able to carry a load that is many, many, many times heavier than the ant itself is. How cool, right? Holy Spirit, awaken in us a childlike sense of wonder. How extraordinary is the God of creation? I'm telling you, he made everything. He made it all. One day in a Christian school, the teacher in the classroom was emphasizing to her students that God made everything. And, and, and so she was walking around the classroom and she was giving some examples. She said, she said, class, who made all those animals from Africa, like elephants and lions and, and tigers? And, and, and all the students were like, God did. And she said, yeah, and who made all the, 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 the bananas and apples and oranges? and the students, God did. And who made you and I and all people in the world? God did. And she, she continued to walk around the class citing these examples. You know, who made this? God did. Who made that? God did. She got to the back of the classroom where there was a couple of tables that were used for, for you know, the art department. And the, there was some, some paint that had been sloppily spilled on the table. And she said, who made this mess? And the kids all said, God did. <laughs> Got it ingrained in their system. God made everything. Well, God doesn't make messes. <laughs> he addresses messes, but God don't make messes and God don't make junk. Say amen. <laughs> Folks, listen very carefully. Life on planet Earth is not a fluke. The world is not a freak of nature. It's not the result of a massive gas explosion. As some would say, the Big Bang. Listen carefully to me. The origin of the species is not the evolution of a primordial blob. No, no. The origin of the species, it's God sculpting the body of a, a man who would be named Adam. And then God breathing the breath of life into him and, and then putting him to sleep. And then Jesus performed the first ever operation. He surgically removed Adam's spare rib and, and he fashioned from that rib a beautiful woman named Eve. Somebody says, Pastor Brian, how do you know that Eve was beautiful? Because I look at my wife and she's beautiful and I know that she has descended from the original woman, Eve. And so if Barb is beautiful, then Eve must have been beautiful. I rest my case. You see, complex life as we know it on earth is not due to random chance. It is all about divine order. It is intelligent design. You ought to be saying, amen. It's about the creative handiwork of a brilliant, benevolent God. Come on, that's your cue to say a strong amen. Are we all crystal clear on the simple terms of the gospel? You see, when we make that, that personal conscious decision to believe and receive Jesus as our Savior, when we, when we get the gospel, when we comprehend the Christ of the cross, why in the world would the Son of God who was without sin die the death of a heinous criminal? Because he was taking the blame for all of humanity, yourself and myself included. Yeah, he took the punishment. So that we could be off the hook. And God said, that's good enough for me. 
Anybody who will put their faith in what my son has accomplished with his death and resurrection, I will gladly welcome them back into my family. This is the good news of the gospel, that we can be spiritually reborn by saying, Jesus, yes, please, come into my life from now on. I want to serve you. I want to follow you all the way to heaven. Man, that's about the smartest decision we ever make in our life. But listen, if we choose to be a bona fide, born-again Christian, that's going to require that we understand this. To believe the gospel is not only to believe in Jesus, it is also to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And furthermore, it is also to believe that the creation account from Genesis is true. That's how everything came into play. You see, to become a follower of Jesus essentially means that you are believing in creation. And of course, if there's a creation, there has to be a creator. And that you are also believing in creation gone bad as a result of the fall of humanity, original sin. But it means that you also believe not only in creation and creator and creation gone bad, things really messed up because of sin, but you also believe in creation restored, or we might call it recreation. Right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man or woman or boy or girl, if any person be in Christ. In other words, if they put their faith in the saviorship of Jesus. If anybody becomes a Christian, it says they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. The old me is gone. And behold, all things become new. Now you're looking at the new me that is decidedly a follower of Jesus. No turning back. This is the new creation, and we have the privilege to be a part of it. You see, to become a Christian means that that you now subscribe to the Word of God and therefore you embrace the biblical model of creation and you reject the theory of evolution. Look, if you study the Gospels, you will find Jesus himself referenced creation. In fact, he was highly involved in creation. Yeah, anybody who sits down and reads the Gospel of John chapter 1, the Epistle of Colossians chapter 1, and then the book of Hebrews chapter 1, if you read those three chapters, you cannot come to any other conclusion than this. Jesus is the creator. Yeah, those chapters clearly tell us Jesus created all things. If you want to believe in Jesus, you have to believe in what Jesus believes. Can I say that again? If you want to believe in Jesus, you have to believe in what Jesus believes. I've met people who claim to be a Christian, but they claim to also believe in evolution. I say, what is wrong with this picture? You can't believe that Jesus is your Savior without also believing that He is your Creator. There was one young man who was a solid Bible-believing Christian, but at school in science class, the teacher was pushing hard for evolution. And one morning, the teacher showed up in the classroom. Here's this young man. He's already there, and he's got this, he's got this model set up on his desk. It's a mini replica of the Eiffel Tower. It's, it's pretty, pretty good detail, this model. And the teacher can't help but notice this model, and he comes over to this young man, and he says, wow, that's... That's impressive. Did you build that yourself? And the young man said, no. Teacher said, well, do you mind me asking, who built this? Young man said, nobody. It built itself. (laughs) Some of the other students in the class that that knew what what they've been teaching in in recent days in that science class, they, they got it. They began to snicker. They realized the point that this young man was, was trying to make. Folks, whether it be a model of the Eiffel Tower or whether it be the real deal, Eiffel Tower itself, it is ludicrous nonsense to think that it built itself. But it's no more ridiculous than to think that this amazing, beautiful world that we live in just evolved from a chemical reaction in a swamp. This amazing, complex world that you see. It did not make itself. No, no, it's the design of a brilliant creator. 
Yeah, this all came from the mind of Christ. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, it says, For every house is built by someone. Every Eiffel Tower is built by someone. But God is the builder of everything. Oh my goodness, God created all the raw materials for everything that has been built that you see around us. Somebody put it this way. If you really want to make an apple pie from scratch, keywords from scratch, if you really want to you know, bake an apple pie from scratch, first you have to create some dirt. And then you have to create a little thing called an apple seed and plant that seed and, and grow that apple tree and then harvest a crop of apples. And then you can go ahead and bake your pie. And if you want to serve that pie a la mode, you know, with ice cream on top, then first you're going to have to create a cow. <laughs> kind of gives a whole new meaning to the expression making something from scratch, doesn't it? All right. I want to share with you in the time that we have remaining a few reasons why God's creativity is so extraordinary. Are you ready? If you're taking notes, number one is this. His method of creation is truly extraordinary. What's his method? God creates by speaking words of faith. He literally speaks stuff into existence. Genesis chapter 1, and throughout the creation week, we see this pattern. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, God speaks words with his mouth. That's where his create, how his creativity comes. God said, let there be plants. God said, let there be birds. God said, let there be sea creatures, and so on. And there was. Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. As Pastor Louis Giglio calls it, he says he's the star-breathing God. Hebrews chapter 11, it's, it's the chapter of the Bible that we call the faith Hall of Fame, and there's where we see the pattern. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, Noah did this. By faith, Moses did this. By faith, Abraham did this. In verse 3, we see by faith, God did this. He created everything. Here's what it says in verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, right? By the words of his mouth. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. In other words, he made it from scratch. It was the Danish philosopher and theologian Soren Kierkegaard who said this, God creates something out of nothing. Wonderful, you say. But even more wonderful, he creates saints out of sinners. Everybody say, that's me. That is wonderful. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, the apostle Paul refers to the Lord as the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Or as it's worded in the old King James Version, he's the God who speaks those things that are not as though they were. You see, that's how God exercises his creative power, by speaking words of faith. And he is wanting to train every one of us to do the same. God is creative, and he inspires his people to also be creative by faith in the word of God. You can frame your future by faith. You can frame the future of your children and your grandchildren by speaking words of faith over them. You can declare that the goodness of God, the wisdom of God, the favor of God is operating in your life, in your children's lives. I declare that these children are going to rise up and they're going to be godly men and women of leadership in their generation. These children are going to prosper and have good success in everything they put their hands to do. Wow, you can speak those words of faith over your kids kids when you are praying with them at bedtime. And I want you to know God is going to honor your words of faith. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Got to learn how to be fluent in the language of faith. That's God's primary language. My friends, would you agree with me? This is an extraordinary means of creativity by speaking things into existence by faith in God. All right. Let's move on. Number two, God's creation is extraordinary because it is so doggone beautiful and functional. 
beautiful and functional. We see it all over the place. If you study life and science and the world that we live in, it is so incredibly fascinating. I mean, there are so many systems that are, that are built in, and, and, and these are systems that help to sustain life on this planet. So many things that are breathtakingly beautiful, not to mention delicious. You know, water falls down out of the sky. We call that rain, and, and it falls on the land to help the land to produce all kinds of food. How many fellow watermelon lovers do we have in the house this afternoon? Am I the only one? Come on, hands up nice and high if you love watermelon and assorted other kinds of foods that the land produces, all compliments of Jesus. It's so Awesome. When was the last time that, that you stopped to closely examine a flower? Oh, the exquisite, colorful designs of flowers. Matthew chapter 6, right in the middle of, of the Sermon on the Mount, verses 28 and 29. Jesus himself referenced this. He, he said, even King Solomon in his royal robes was not dressed as elegantly as these flowers of the field. Are you familiar with that great theologian, Sherlock Holmes? In the book called The Adventure of the Naval Treaty, Holmes is examining and smelling a rose. And then he makes this, this deduction to his sidekick, Watson. He says, you know, most of the elements of life are necessary. They are required for the sustaining of life on planet Earth. But these flowers, this is bonus. These flowers are not required. They are not necessary per se. But obviously, it is the creator God who is wanting to show us how much he cares about us that he has given these flowers purely for our enjoyment, for our pleasure. I say thank you very much, Sherlock Holmes. What a true word that is. Folks, all of these seed-bearing plants that produce after their kind are the signature of an extraordinary creator. All in favor of having lunch today, say I. Then there's the animal kingdom. You know, from the peacock to the hummingbird and so many others. How many times have we seen these wildlife programs on television and you hear yourself saying, wow, that's incredible. You know, some of the information that is shared about how these, these animals function, such as amazing features of the creatures. You know, they have these God-given instincts. The animals have parental instincts. They have protective instincts. They have phenomenal migratory instincts, right? And how about food gathering instinct? You know, I will never forget the experience that we had as a family. Our kids were young. We were living in Nova Scotia. And one time we went out to a place called Chibucto Head and we, we took a, a, a perch up on some, some rocks overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. And we were wanting to go out there to, to watch the whales out in the water. But instead, we were treated to a fantastic show because right in front of us, kind of level with where we were sitting, about probably 30 to 40 feet above the, the, the water, here, here comes an osprey, otherwise known as the kingfisher bird. You may have seen him on a, an old $5 bill, and he truly is well named because he's the king of, of fishermen. And, and here's this osprey, and he's hovering. He's hovering in the gentle breeze, and he's looking down. And then all of a sudden, whew, he went into this steep dive, and he hit the water. And then moments later, he comes splashing up out of the water, and he's got this, this wiggling fish in his claws. And no kidding, that bird flew directly over where we were sitting and then off to a perch in the distance where he had his lunch. And we were just blown away. We're like, oh, God, that's an incredible show that you put on for us. Then further to that, I did a little bit of reading about the osprey, and I found that because of this thing called refraction in the water, you know, when you look in the water, the object is actually here, but it appears to be here. And I discovered in studying the osprey bird that when it dives, it doesn't dive to where the bird appears to be, it dives to where the, or where the fish appears to be, but it dives to where the fish actually is. 
Who taught that bird how to fish like that? Surely it was the Creator God. That's brilliant. And there are so many other examples that could be given, folks. The extraordinary Creator God is reflected in the extraordinariness of God's animal kingdom. And, and of course, if you've ever watched any of the, the Flintstones cartoons, you know that animals can also be very useful in terms of household appliances, right? All right, listen, even better than plant life or animal life, God's extraordinary creativity is displayed in humanity. Come on. If you study the human anatomy, it is remarkable some of the systems that are incredibly functional in a human body. You know, people who design high-tech cameras, they cannot even yet duplicate the marvel of the function of human eyes. And then there's, there, then there's the built-in defense systems and the healing properties. It's amazing how our body has been designed by God to recover from illness and, and from injury. And what about your DNA? That is an absolutely astounding study of information. No wonder David wrote in Psalm 139 verse 14, he said, I will praise you, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, we've often quoted that scripture, but did you know that that Bible statement is set in the context of a few verses that is dealing with one of the most special gifts that God has invested in the human race. It is a sacred gift of sexuality and of intimacy by which we can produce human babies. It's in that context that the psalmist says, Lord, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He should have been saying, I praise you that my wife is fearfully and wonderfully made. It is so amazing when you begin to study the human body. And then there's the respiratory system. If you love breathing, say amen. Amen. Don't forget about the electrical nervous system. I mean, constantly sending messages to and from the brain information that we need for, for being effectively functional as humans. And also the circulatory system. Hey, fun fact. If you were to take all of the bloodstream of an average person and stretch it out in one long line... It would be 60,000 miles of veins and arteries and capillaries from one person's body. Now, now, if you multiply that 60,000 miles worth, that's two and a half laps around planet Earth. That's just one person's bloodstream. What about if you multiply that by the number of people that are in this room? So much bloodstream. Come on. And not one blood clot among us. I speak it out by faith today. Not one blood clot among us that would, that would put our life in peril. Thank you very much, Jesus. Listen, I speak this word of faith, and I say that the bloodstream of every one of us is perfectly healthy. I said, perfectly healthy. The life is in the blood. That's what we read there in Leviticus 17, 14. Life is in the blood. Thank you, Lord, that there is, there is no blockage in any arteries. Listen, if there's anybody here today that has recently received a report from the doctor's office about the health of your blood, and you were a little disturbed by that report, you should take hold of this word of faith right now and say, thank you, Jesus. I believe that, that my bloodstream is perfect perfect. Amen is right. Absolutely. So plants and animals and humans are proof positive of the extraordinary creator. And furthermore, the universe has something to say about it as well. The universe is so beautiful and so functional. All of these planets and stars and heavenly bodies in their orbits, it is such divine orderliness. And when was the last time, actually, that you got out of the city, out of the glare of the lights, into the country on a clear night and looked up into the sky that was full of stars? What a sight that is. In Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. 
I'll tell you what else. The prophet Isaiah, he said that God has a name assigned to every one of those billions upon billions of stars. Isaiah 40, verse 26. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Oh, amen. Not one of them is missing. And if one of them did go missing, I'm pretty sure that the God who is, has revealed himself as the good shepherd who, who leaves the 99 and goes looking for the one that's lost, I'm pretty sure that if there was a star that went missing, he'd go looking for that one too. He created all the stars. Just turn to your neighbor and say, all of a sudden, I'm craving an ice cream cone from the Milky Way. <laughs> When you look through a high-powered telescope, what you see is amazing. It should move us to praise. In the words of the hymn writer, Carl Boberg, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee, how great thou art. Come on, everybody say, how great thou art. No kidding, it is so true. Praise is the appropriate response to the Creator God. All right, quickly. May I give you one more reason why God is extraordinary in his role as the creator. So first, creation is extraordinary because of the method. He speaks stuff into being. Secondly, creation is extraordinary because it's so beautiful and so functional. Last but not least, number three is this. He is the extraordinary creator by right of ownership. Everybody say ownership. Yeah, God owns it all. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, including you and I. Psalm 89, verse 11 says, The heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. Listen very carefully. A low level of ownership is ordinary. But a high level of ownership is extraordinary. You see, if all I own is the clothes that I'm wearing, that's not even ordinary ownership. Right? But if I have attain a high level of ownership, that is extraordinary. Follow the line of thought here. If you own your own home and the property that it's sitting on, it's all paid off, then you are blessed. You are smart, but you are an ordinary homeowner because that's a fairly common accomplishment in life. But if you own your own home and you also own the cottage at the lake plus several other properties so that you can rent them out, then you are prosperous. My friend, you are successful. You are certainly well-to-do and you have arrived at an extraordinary level of ownership. Now, if you own hundreds, if not thousands of properties across the map, then you are either a major bank or a ridiculously rich real estate magnate, and you are more than a conqueror. You are more than an extraordinary owner. But if you own countless business properties and facilities all over the world, then you are a fabulously wealthy international corporation, most likely Coca-Cola or Walmart or some such thing. If that's you, then you are on the elite level of extraordinary ownership. However, if you are the owner of planet Earth and all the other planets in our solar system and all the other solar systems in our galaxy and all the other galaxies in the universe, then that would make you God. And you have achieved the ultimate level of ownership. Of course, that's a spot that's reserved only for God himself, so don't even try to get there. The point is, a high level of ownership is a very extraordinary thing. And God owns it all. 
And therefore, I submit to you, he is such an extraordinary, praiseworthy creator. Oh, yes, he is. I want to give you one more verse of scripture this morning. And I'm going to ask you if you would stand out of respect for this Bible verse. Would you all stand with me? In the book of Revelation chapter 4. Yeah, it's a scene right out of heaven. Revelation 4, verse 11. Here's what it says. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Because you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Somebody say amen. Amen. Oh, he is so worthy of all honor and praise. He made it all. He owns it all. He loves it all. He is so awesome. It is so right for the created to worship the creator. I'm going to say that again. It is so right for the created, that be you and I, To worship the creator who made us and breathed into us the breath of life. Oh yeah, the clay should not question the potter. The clay should not complain to the potter. I don't really like the way you made me. No, no. No, no, no. Only a foolish pot of clay would disrespect the potter. Trust me, the potter knows what he's doing. He's a master creator. And he did a wonderful job on you. We always tell our little granddaughter, Remy, you're a beautiful, wonderful child of God. It's getting ingrained in her system. She will not become puffed up and proud, but she will clearly know her identity in God. She's a wonderful, beautiful child of God. And so are every one of you. It's so right for the created being to raise their voice in honor of the creator. What a God he is. Oh yeah, he's extraordinary by virtue of his creatorship. Oh yes, he is. So as we bring our service to its conclusion today, can we take a few moments? Would you join me? Can we lift our hearts? Can we lift our voices in praise to God? If you're able to receive this word of the Lord that I have shared with you today, would you just let that spirit of praise rise up on the inside of you? Would you get ready to just offer up to the Lord some humble adoration? Would you begin to just just open up your mouth and, and begin to speak and say, Lord, I thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord, you made me. You created me, Lord. Oh, God, I thank you for, for the breath of life. I thank you, Lord, that, that I, 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 I've been recreated through the new birth. I thank you, Lord, for food on the table. I thank you, Lord, for the children that you have placed in, in my trust, in my household. I thank you, Lord. You are an awesome creator. Come on, folks, would you join me? Would you begin to just lift your voice up to the Lord. Don't make me do all of the work here, okay? I want you to begin to praise Him. I want you to begin to offer up some sincere words of gratitude to God. What a creator He is. Come on, just lift up your voice and begin to just speak to the Lord and say, I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. If you don't know what else to say, just begin to say, oh God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a creator you are. Oh, thank God for all of the good things of life that have been provided for our enjoyment. Thank you, Lord. When I drive through British Columbia, I'm going to make a point of being on the lookout for that water coming down on the rocks by the side of the road. I'm going to make sure I have a cup along with me. And Jesus, I'm going to drink of that water. I'm going to drink and I'm going to savor every sip of that water. And I'm going to let that water speak into my soul and say, God is awesome. God is an extraordinary creator. And don't you forget it. Oh, my soul. Jesus, we love you today. We thank you. Oh, God, we give you thanks. You've made us, Lord. 
God, I believe that as you are creatively speaking into our spirit, you are enabling us to creatively prophesy our future. And we are believing that, that you are working out your best purposes, your best plans, your, your best uh, plans for prosperity and for health and for happiness and for outreach to share our faith with others. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are creatively, powerfully, wisely at work in us and through us. You are our God. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We worship you this afternoon in these holy moments. In these holy moments, Lord, we commit we will never again take you for granted. We will never allow you to be common or ordinary in our thinking. Holy Spirit, help us to leave church today so utterly convinced our God is an awesome God. Our Lord is so amazing and so gracious in all that He has created out of His loving kindness toward us. We receive it, Lord. We receive, we receive that voice of the Holy Spirit telling us to know that the creation model in Genesis is absolute unerring truth. We totally adhere to it in Jesus' name. Before we conclude and go our separate ways, I want to have the privilege of leading us in a simple prayer of salvation. Let's do this together, church. In a moment, we're all going to pray this prayer boldly. But before we do that, in this moment of personal commitment with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm simply asking, if you're here today and you don't know for sure that you are born again, if you really don't know for sure that you have found your place in the family of God, or maybe you somehow drifted, you've gotten away from the Lord, and you just know you need to rededicate yourself to God's best plans for you. Before we all pray this prayer together, if that's you, if you need to commit or recommit to Jesus today, just raise your hand up nice and high and wave at me. Yes, I see your hands over at the back. Are there others? Just wave at me if that's where you're at. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, touch our hearts. If you just know, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to walk with God. Anybody else? Just wave at me before we pray this prayer together. All right. Come on, church. Let's all pray this. Heavenly Father, of course I turn my life over to you. I totally believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Died on the cross for me. Rose from the grave to champion a new life for me. Forgive me, Lord, for all I've ever done wrong. Oh, cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live out the Christian life, knowing full well you are my creator, and I will worship you accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on. Somebody give the Lord a hand. Oh, so good to be a part of the family of God. Thank you for watching today's Church Online. We pray that today's worship and message was so encouraging to you. Hey, if you live in Regina or if you're ever in the Regina area and you've never joined us for church, we would love to see you here one Sunday in person. Remember, there are two services for you to take part in. One is at 9.30 or 11.30. We'd love to see your smiling face here. If that's not possible, we'll see you right back here next Sunday for Church Online.